Welcome to the It Feels Right podcast with Robin Stone. This week we are going to dig into, of course, the tip of the week, but a lot of exciting pickleball coming up in Sacramento and Minnesota this upcoming weekend. And we are also going to touch on Mr. Adam Stone. Yeah, previewing these these incredibly new, exciting teams in both tournaments and, of course, a little uh, PPA MLP merger chat. Uh, definitely going to be a good one. Oh, it feels right. Let's get after because it. Because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Yeah, Rob, that's, I mean, that's what I miss so much about pro pickleball is having completely soaking wet clothes, sprinting in between matches to a 125 degree porta potty while cramping and trying to eat some food and having the magnesium electrolyte <laughs> along the way. That is special stuff and what I just remember so well. Yes. Good yeah, times. It's, uh, it's, it's tough because you. Well, me anyways, like I'll, I'll not hydrate well enough at the beginning of the week. And then the day of comes and it's like, oh, well, I got to make up for all the lack of hydration I had. So I'm just going to crush 30 packets of uh, electrolyte powder. And then for the next 48 hours, I just like, dude, I'm just like a bubble of gas. And I'm just like walking around just everywhere. It's like, I don't know if that's just me, but it like it, it puts my stomach and just gives me ultimate ga- it's gas for days. Oh yeah, no, it's yeah, it's. Yeah. Uh, I remember I used to have, get an upset stomach before eighth grade algebra tests. So you know I've had some random performance anxiety throughout my uh, schooling and athletic career. I, I guess that's just what it is. That is what it is, and this is uh, you know on on par for our rambling intros. This is this is it. We're we're on our second episode of having a real like production. This is dope. This is hey. Second week in a row too. Look at our consistency. I don't want to. I don't want to call it too soon, but we're on a roll already with you know, back to back podcasts. Yeah, and of course, not too much structure, but that's two in a row with notes, Rob. I mean, that's that's real stuff for us. Notes. Hey, notes. I got a, I got a pen. I got a notebook. Ooh, Look, <laughs> just, uh, right. we also have we also have our producer Josh, um, that's kind of in the background here, and and we're leaning on him a little bit to to make the production good. Sounds like we've run into issues every time we've got on, gotten on so far. So I don't th- I don't know if, if we've got that ironed out yet. But um, our goal is to make this, um, yeah, really high production quality, and it might take a little time to get there. But we are working towards it. Yeah, we certainly are. And uh, you know, we did a little trending up, trending down section uh, uh, last episode, and I'm sure some people are talking crap because I'm I'm always I'm the good cop. We we know that Rob and I'm always a trending up guy, and of course the merger not trending up. But I had some insider info and I said it was trending up and look at us now. Just one episode later, we've got uh, some some stuff situated. I, I'm repping the hard eights again. Uh, happy for the merger. Happy uh, to be under one umbrella and. Uh, yeah, I have no doubt they still have plenty of stuff to iron out, but signing that dotted line was a great place to start. Yeah, it's uh, finally finally a little bit of clarity in terms of where all that stands. It's uh, yeah, it's official. It's it's happened. Uh, it's I think, like you said, there's still a lot to be determined on how it actually plays out and what it actually looks like, and and how 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 it'll be received honestly as a as a viewer and like will will it being under one roof kind of muddle muddle what mlp was and will it even get the will it even get the focus and attention that it got when it was separate there's a lot of questions and i think it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out and i think we've got a little clarity in terms of and we'll get to this in a little bit here um of of who's going where and who who ended up signing with MLP PPA? That you know, opting out and desi- deciding to do their own thing. We've got some interesting pairings coming up here in Sacramento that we'll get to in a little bit here. But um, yeah, merger's done. It's uh, it'll be fun to see it play out. And I know I keep hearing people say, you know, it's great to have all the best players under one roof. Now it's uh, you know not so much the case though. You still gotta 
I mean, we'll get into it, but you got JW and Georgia and Tardio all playing at APT Sacramento, which I find super, super interesting. So, you know, one bit of the tour wars is done, but the APP, APP is not going anywhere. So it's, and there's, there's, there's very high level pickleball being played over there. So it's, it's interesting stuff. Yeah, and and I, and I think that's that's a big factor is what kind of momentum will MLP have? It's it's already been it's obviously been squashed a little bit. Does do they have one event and it's just back to like it was pre merger, or is there kind of a lag between where it was and, and having to build that up? And Rob, I'm pretty involved in the pickleball space, but I'll admit I don't know much about Bruce Popko. Do you? Do you know a lot about him? Seems to be the head of the snake for MLP and kind of running some operations moving forward. Uh, yeah, t- tell me, tell me I, who that is. Yeah, I don't know a ton about Bruce. I, I, I went back and forth with Bruce a fair amount with my, <coughs> excuse me, with my negotiations. Um, every every interaction I've had with Bruce has been positive. He's he's he was, yeah, easy to chat with, um, understanding, smart. Um, you know all of the things you would hope. So, but in terms of more interactions with that, don't really know much. Um, but yeah, every every interaction I've had is pleasant. I think I think I saw he, he's a CEO moving forward. Is that right? Well, yeah, I think know, yeah. I'm not positive, so I'm not just going to make that statement. But yeah, that, that I, I know he's somewhere high up, and he's going to be very involved moving forward. And Rob, you were one of the players. You mentioned the negotiations with Bruce. That. There was there was a situation where there's restructuring of contracts and there's also a buyout clause. Tell me what happened with your specific situation. Yeah, well, you know, I think there's a, there was a time where a lot of these a lot of these contracts were at a standstill and it was a little bit of like an impasse and stalemate of like, okay, well, you know, this is what we want and there wasn't like a lot of room either way. I eventually got on a call with Connor Pardo. He was just like, you know, some of the players I'm familiar with, I decided to hop on a call, you know, with you guys. And, you know, I've obviously talked to Connor quite a bit in the past in respect to PPA contracts a couple years ago and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so we chatted, we, you know, we chatted about different options, what it might look like. And I decided to, I decided to do a contract buyout where I can basically just go my own way and um, get released from the contract and focus on whatever I want to focus on. I, I, I want to have a big push internationally and focus a lot on the growth um, of the game in Europe and Asia. Um, and this is that that allows me to do that. So. Um, yeah, I think I think I don't know who who all got bought out, but I think we have some clues in respect to, and it's, it doesn't necessarily mean a buyout, but we have some clues in respect to entrance in APP Sacramento. Uh, but it, that could also just mean that contracts aren't finished being negotiated, right? And they have the ability to play whatever they want. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely some clues out there, and I think we'll you know I think players will say you know, and it'll be very obvious shortly. But I, you know, for me, I thought it was the best option to, uh, yeah, to to focus on APPs, to focus on international stuff, and it looks like I'll still be eligible to participate in MLP, just not this first draft. Gotcha. Okay. Now that's a little clarity there for for your situation. That's good. Well, why, why don't we before we get into the the tip of the week, which is clearly going to be something that we do. Uh, every episode moving forward as it's right there in the title let's talk about sacramento open uh to kind of some of those pairings that you were alluding to and 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 it's not clean perfect information but can kind of maybe give us a little insight into some of the other players situations yeah i think i mean this the one thing that stood out to me when looking at sacramento and and i'm not playing sacramento because i have you know, torn meniscus that I'm trying to work through and rehab and get stronger. I'm looking to come back for Miami here at, at the end of the month. But for the, I mean, we're talking about Sacramento, California. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call that, you know, for most of the country, an easy place to get to. I mean, obviously there's a lot of players in California, but uh, I mean, the sheer number of entrants in this tournament was surprising. I mean, men's doubles has 36 in the qualifier, 36 teams. Um, women's doubles has 13 qualifier teams. Um, mixed doubles has 26 in the pre-qualifier. And then they'll oh have my. a qualifier, and then they'll have the main draw. 
I mean, so we're seeing just an absolute, and we, you know, we saw this, Adam, at the PPAs, like just the utter influx of, of new teams and new talent and new players trying to break in is, is something else in terms of both tours. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's going to be a hard time to break into pro pickleball. I mean, you're going to, you're going to have to really train. Like if you're a new player coming in, you're gonna have to really train and have good partners and, and it's not, it's not like how it used to be. That's for sure. Well, hope, hope is a strong thing. So, uh, there's not many professional sports that you kind of have a shot or have a chance and, and yeah. being the early stages, even though it's nowhere near as early as, you know, when we started several years ago, uh, I, I think that that hope is, is a real thing and, and that yep. you have the chance to, to wiggle in there to get some uh, wins against players that you've seen on YouTube. And I think that that's a special thing and everyone wants to get a piece of that pie and kind of get in the mix. And not to mention, I mean, you mentioned pro level at Sacramento, 1,490 total entrants when you look at the amateur level as well. It's, it's, it's California, I get it. But I would not say Northern California is necessarily the hotbed or even close to it that Southern California is. So pretty wild from a pro level and amateur level to have uh, this kind of interest uh, for a tournament in Sacramento, and I, of course, of course, I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's great to see. I mean, obviously, it's it's a credit to, you know, the tournaments the APP runs, and they they do a fantastic job on the amateur side and give players a great experience. So, uh, no surprise. And I was there at Sacramento last year. It's it's um, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful park. You're gonna have good weather. You know, it's it is still California. I know they've had a fair amount of rain up there and snow and the Sierra Nevadas, but I mean, typically pretty solid weather. It was great weather last year, Um, but like in some of the pairings, you know, we talked about players that might not have signed the MLP PPA agreement. It's not might not have. They clearly have not signed. Um, It's just, it's a question of whether they have been bought out, which unclear, or if whether they're still negotiating um, with with the organization, MLP PPA. So we're going to have to come up with the – they are going to have to come up with the – are they going to come up with a new name for MLP, PPA? Are we going to call it NUCO for the rest of our lives? What's, what's that situation? Do we know? No, I think, I think they're both keeping their brand and their, and their title and what they are, MLP and PPA. So I don't think okay. there's going to be – I don't think there's going to be a change of name. Uh, of course, that – you know, I, I could be wrong on that. But I, I, I did hear that through the grapevine that they're just going to keep rolling as is. Okay, right on. Uh, but in terms of some of the pairings, and mixed, we have Susanna Barr playing with Eric Lang. You know, Eric Lang is somebody that, you know, I thought could maybe sign MLP PPA, don't, didn't know. Um, and maybe he still will, maybe, yeah. So don't know on that. Uh, Jill Braverman is playing with Gabe Tardio. So we've got Gabe Tardio in this tournament. We've got Millie Rain. We've, we've got, we don't have Dylan Frazier, but we do have JW in Georgia. So kind of four out of the five of that group that was um, kind of all negotiating together throughout this whole thing, um, especially when it was when MLP decided to break off and they were everybody was trying to vie for those five players. So very fascinating that they're playing and it'll be I mean, that's just it's going to make APP super fun to watch. So it's yeah, it's 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 fun to see. I don't know what the status is, but hopefully we'll find out. Um, We've got. Yeah, I mean, of course, JW and Georgia are playing together. JW is playing with Will Howells and Men's. Tardio is playing with Andre Diescu and Men's, and we just saw them get to the final of the PPA. So, I mean, look at look at the talent that we have playing in the APP, right? It's 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 unreal. It's great to see. Um, it's just a matter of will will the Tardio Johnson crew stay kind of free agents and play whatever, or will they will they eventually sign over and go to PPA? Yeah, that's a, that's a solid little matchup too. I know Will Howes probably isn't a household name, but he he, he won an APP with CJ Klinger earlier in the year, and I think of that four, meaning Gabe Tardy, Andre Deescu, JW, and Will Howes, that JW is the best player in men's doubles. So I think that that could be a fun matchup uh, right there, as you have. Uh, you know, number one, J-Dub, number four, Will Howes against two and three, Tardio, who have had recent success. So it, it is some spicy matchups and some different matchups, and I know that's what the diehards yearn for. So uh, it's not just Sacramento. It's going to be this, the same thing in Lakeville, Minnesota, a little south of Minneapolis, as, you know, top woman, top male, not in 
the field you know, are just so consistent. So there, there are some really cool matchups uh, uh, throughout the weekend, and I think it's going to be great uh, as a, a viewer and a fan, which is what I am. Yeah, and I think some of the <clears> – <throat> well, from the matchups I know in, in Minnesota, I know we have Jack Sock not playing with Colin Schick. I don't know if that – do you know if that's uh, going to be a regular thing moving forward where they're not playing together? Is this a one-off where Jack's playing with Julian Arnold? I, I think it's a one-off. Uh, as I know, Sock is pretty high on his buddy Schick's game, uh, and rightfully so. So I do think it's a one-off, but Schick is playing that tournament with – uh, Eric Hot Toddy Roddy, who is a Charlotte guy, and that is he is in the group. Uh, so maybe it could be more than just one, uh, given the situation. But I, I think it's definitely something to monitor, uh, as you know, when you're as talented as Jack is, rather get a few different partners. You know, that's just another team in the mix. Not that that him and Colin can't get some big wins. Uh, it's just. It's a talented duo in Julian and uh, and Sock, and I think that they pair fairly well together. Neither one really wants to dink that much. Uh, Julian can really set up with some good drives from the back of the court and, and rolling those drops and, and speeding up at the kitchen line. And I, I had a pretty interesting conversation about falling into the trap as a right side player of just making balls and just being the guy that hits it in a lot to set up your partner. And I said I got into this conundrum a bit on the right as well in my career. I think it's better to have a balance where you have to strike some fear, you have to speed up, and you have yeah. to blend the two together. Consistent play, of course, but you got to pull some triggers and, and kind of use your your solid left side partner well uh, could be a great option. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's always... A delicate balance and hard to find but just a little little strategy talk with the doctor yeah it's a perfect segue into into tip of the week which you know as a right side guy myself it's and we've talked about this a lot adam in terms of that balance of when to be just solid make a ton of balls and when to actually pull some triggers right and i think one thing that players probably don't think of enough amateur players is frequency um as you know if you're if you're pulling the trigger early and often, they're sitting on it, they're waiting on it, they're always kind of they're always kind of on edge waiting for the speed up. But if you're dink first, you know, speed up second, and like to a big ratio, your speed ups become so much more effective. And especially on the right side, it's not it's frequency but also placement because as we know with a lot of the top guys, whether you're whether you have JW in front of you or Ben or anybody like that that's sitting big forehand in the middle, um, even Ignatowicz, you have to be able to pull line. You can't just go kind of cross the body or middle like you, you know. We saw Tardio do it to Ben and Mesa, going high left shoulder, and it's a, it's a really, really tough place. But you have to have not just that one. You have to hit multiple spots, and you have to not do it too often. So it's this really fine line and fine balance of trying to dial in how often you're pulling it and where. And I think that, ratios, that ratio takes a while to dial in, but I think if you go into rec games and practice and, and just – which is very easy to pull triggers and wreck, right? Because there's no real consequence and it's fun to do firefights and it's fun to pull triggers. But if you really are practice patience and practice and then pull triggers at the right times, it's, um, it's fun to see how much more effective your speed ups actually are without changing much other than purely frequency. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And of course it's opponent dependent and it kind of is in flux and, and kind of changes with, with certain opponents and a lot of it is, and I've said this on the broadcast before, is how hot is the big man? How hot is the left side player? Is he just on fire? Then maybe you just tone it down and just let him go. Uh, is he making some mistakes or, or maybe not as crisp? Maybe that's when you need to step up and, and kind of create some percentage of the offense uh, for your team. And another big thing as the right side player about attacking line is often that ball is not going to come right back to you. That's going to go to the middle where your partner can be. So that is, yep. uh, if you attack, you know, the Riley Newman pancake, you talked about Ben and JW, all good at the right shoulder, that's often coming back to you at 90 miles an hour straight back to you in a direct path. When you yep. go 
line and you go to their backhand as a right-sided player, then sure, sometimes it's coming back to you and some players are better at, at, at putting that back up the line to you, but a lot of players are going to go middle with that ball. And I think, you know, you have a, like I said, Riley Newman pancake or a Jack Sock uh, forehand uh, right there waiting in the middle. Yeah. That's a pretty good situation and is probably going to benefit your team well over half the time. Yeah, hundred percent. And and not only talking about the first ball off the off the speed up right, but um, knowing that, like like you said, knowing that I would say, man, I, it's got to be a pretty high percentage. I would say you're speeding up line to the backhand. That thing's going back middle, eighty um, percent plus of the time. It, it's super. Yeah, it's it's high frequency back middle. It's such a hard counter to go right back down the line, and like you have such a small window to actually do that. Um, that's not usually going to be the case. So even taking that forehand speed up, whether it's out of the air, whether it's off the bounce, and then immediately immediately setting up backhand and to where you're actually kind of fading off the court in case they do come right at you or off or, or to your left shoulder, while also having your partner's forehand in the middle, it's a, it's a deadly combo. So I think if you're playing some rec today, be a little patient on the speed ups, but try, yeah, try that speed up down the line and then fade backhand if you're that right side player. And also talk to your talk to your partner on on frequency and what they want you to do. Like when I play with Andre and I'm get, and I'm being too passive, he knows that my speed ups, even if even if I get burned, we get burned on them a fair amount that we have to show it. To, to show that we have offense and show that we're dangerous and to show that we're going to still be aggressive. So there's lots of times where I'm being too passive and he's like, Rob, keep pulling, man, keep pulling. Even if I'm like, well, the last two pulls got us burnt, but he's like, he's great in terms of knowing that percentage-wise over the course of a match, it's we're going to be ahead and the fact that you know we have to keep them on their heels and we can't let them dictate, we need to also dictate. Yeah, it's long-term math, super important, hard to see just a couple of shots and the benefit that you're getting from those in the long term. And the last thing that I will say to touch on, on what you uh, mentioned, Rob, is we think of sliding to your right as a right-sided player as an initial counter. When your left-sided opponent is going to attack you, sliding to your right after you speed up is something that I think gets a little bit overlooked. So when you talked about speeding up with the forehand whether out of the air or off the bounce as a right side player and then sliding for the next ball as you have i mean that's a lot to handle you have a we were talking about uh, sock and schick you have that big two-hander uh, of of uh colin schick and then everything else is jacks uh, in the middle with the forehand yep. so that's that makes it tough for that player who is getting attacked when they see that specific lineup that's a lot of paddles and a lot of power straight ahead of you and and that means something yeah, 100% agree. So that is our beautiful tip of the week. Look at us just educating the amateur pickleball scene. And, dude, I actually love talking strategy with you because it's just a lot of it. A lot of it for me is I internalize a lot of it, and it's just stuff I see and stuff like that. I don't actually, you know, it's like when you teach anything, right, You or talk about anything. Like stuff stuff even clicks for stuff clicks for me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's why that makes sense. And I think talking talking strategy and talking tips is is super useful, um, even for us. Yeah, and a shout out to your men's partner Andre Dayescu, who is sharp as a tack. Just just watch him give one interview, and you know he's well spoken and thinks about the game the right way. So uh, shout out to him, uh, kind of understanding the situations and, and knowing even if it's not working a couple times, you're getting the benefit that you need from certain shots. Yeah, and. Don't don't forget to mention that will to win. My God, dude, that guy, <laughs> that guy, that guy doesn't like losing. I'll tell you that. Yeah, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Uh, okay, well let's let's talk a little a little PPA uh, Minnesota. As I mentioned, several top players not there, so we got a little parody here. We got some exciting teams, and uh, we'll start off with with men's doubles. And I kind of have a grouping of four teams, Rob, that I don't see a ton. Of difference then tell me what you think so we have jack sock and julian arnold yeah we have christian alshon and thomas wilson freak athletes out there and court coverage is going to be on point with those two who's with pablo, thomas sorry one more time uh christian alshon yep and then we have pablo and fed 
who are very, very consistent and are, seem to always be in quarterfinals and semifinals and men's doubles. And then you have a very funny uh, combination that we haven't seen in a long time at Matt Wright and Colin Johns. Uh, who do you got of that grouping of four, and does anything stand out between those squads? I mean, that's a pretty fun pairing, Matt and CJ. Um, I Just in terms of that, that four, I would, you know, and I think – this is a. This is based on my thought process of long-term partnerships are super important, and you know you can you know pickleball is interesting. You can just partner up with somebody and you know have great results. But I think the familiarity of Pablo and Fed is gonna is gonna come out on top here in terms of consistency, knowing each other's games. Um, it's indoors in Minnesota. Anything can happen. It's gonna play fast. Um, even though the courts they were last year a little softer, they're a little cushioned, so it it the ball don't, doesn't move through the court as fast. Um, so it plays even though it's indoors and kind of chilly, it, it plays a little slower, but it's still indoor pickleball and it still plays fast. But I feel like um, yeah, I feel like that's going to be there's going to be some fun matchups. But I have to put Pablo and Fed as my favorite in that in that grouping. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense is the comfort. There, there, there's no comfort with any of those other teams. I know Matt and Colin have played together, but this is years ago. So I, I know that the thought of, and skill sets of Sock Arnold, Alshon Wilson are kind of jump off the page a little bit, but there, there's no familiarity there between yep. those, those squads. And, and, you know, maybe that's a small issue. Maybe it's a big issue. Maybe it's no issue at all. We'll just have to see. But I, I'll, I'll stick Pablo and Fed. Uh, um, as coming out of that group of four. A couple other men's teams, we have DJ Young and Deckelbar, who have some pretty good experience together, not only practicing but playing several uh, APP events and a handful of PPAs, you know, a couple years ago. You have Zane and Travis Rattlesnake Rettenmeyer, and I'm very interested to see what kind of ball Zane plays. Uh, men's doubles had a nice bronze run earlier in the year, but the body bag match, as it's being called now, with Eric Lang. So was that a point of emphasis for Eric and Zane as a team? Or is Zane going to keep firing away off the bounce and look to body people up? Uh, I kind of expect him to do so, even though he's not partnering with Eric. Yeah, it'll be <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. There's been, I mean, and that, that kind of goes into what, you know, what's been a fairly fairly prominent topic which is eye protection um do you have do you have a take on eye protection one way or the other adam i mean not really just a yeah personal personal preference uh i it's just not for me it's i'm not comfortable with it now i haven't given it a good run like i yeah. haven't used it 10 times in a row or something like that and became more comfortable with it and i know you don't have to have the lenses either you can just use the frames so, I mean, as it's getting ramped up, I think it's clearly, you know, something that people should be paying attention to. But I, I, I hate issues with sight lines. I hate glares. I hate white backdrops where I can't see the ball. I, I, I don't like any of that. And I just feel like when I'm wearing glasses, uh, especially with my unbelievable amount of sweating, that it's just too much of an issue and affects my specific game too much to really want to do that. Yeah, in terms of comfort and all of that, I'm right there with you. It's it's super uncomfortable for me, um, and the the sweating is the main issue. It's the the just the heavy fogging and it's yeah, it's not comfortable. But at the same time, um, I mean, the game's faster now than it ever has been. Um, I was doing some volley volley with somebody uh, that has that gearbox paddle, and it's like. You know, I'm I'm volley volleying with the with the Lux. They're volley volleying with the gearbox, and it's just like, and my hands are I would say like significantly faster than this person. And dude, the it's just the deflection off that thing is just it's 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 incredibly noticeable. Just hitting like five balls volley volley. It's it, it's just the the way it trampolines off of it's just something else. So and it's legal. So. To me, it's like when you have paddles that are legal like that, that just, it's, it, that pushes the envelope to me to where it's like, oh, this is like playing against somebody that has like a D-Land paddle. It's the same kind of deflection where it's like, that thing can go anywhere really quickly. So, 
uh, yeah, I don't know. I think for a lot of people that it makes sense. Should it be mandated? I, you know, I don't, I don't think so right now. But my opinion on that might change. I've never been, I've never even, I don't think, been close to getting hit in the eye with a ball. Um, and I don't know if that's just luck. Because uh, I mean, I think most of the most of the times that it happens, it's it's silly like fluke deflections off of either some, your partner's paddle or your paddle. Um, so I understand it, but um, yeah, I think yeah, I don't know. I don't think the game's like it's not like racquetball where it's like you're playing with a hard rubber ball that's flying that fast and it's that that hard. But I don't know. Sorry, to me, uh, it's... I just I just thought of the 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 memes of pickleball where it was uh jay kind of moving backwards and hitting a sharp angle overhead that uh was said to be 140 or 150 (laughs) miles per hour so i just thought that was funny i was like maybe more like 50 or 60 miles per hour but racquetballs of course are are flying that fast so yeah Yeah. they're they're gonna they're gonna push the envelope the companies are gonna do whatever they do that to get the hot paddle and that's what people want uh, and that's what they're going to go after. If they, if a paddle has a little buzz about it, you, you can sell a lot and you can make a lot of money, in, at least in the short term. So yeah. uh, it's, it's going to keep happening and it's going to keep increasing, in my opinion, and it's just something uh, we'll have to monitor. And just uh, two more teams in the men's doubles. Yeah. Of course, you have Jay and Pat. Open draw. They could for sure do damage with their experience. And then Hayden Patrick Quinn and Callan Dawson, who unfortunately I have not uh, – in the, in the PPAs that I've commentated, I have not been able to call one of their matches. Uh, and, and I would like to hear from those two, as Callan's a good friend. And Hayden, I uh, love his skill set and some of the stuff he brings to the table. So now that I'm doing the 3 p.m., so if it's, a, if it's not a progression draw and it's a standard draw, uh, it's kind of a cut line to whether you're having a good day or not, whether you make it onto my court at 3 p.m. And some of these really, really, really good players – I have not been able to call their matches this year, and I think that that says a lot about the the level of play that we're seeing in all the disciplines. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing, Adam, because like you know, without the without the come around, without um, yeah, a lot of these players are just getting so much less visibility. You know, like you think about Hayden and Callen, great team. Um, Hayden's incredibly fun to watch, you know, with, you know, with his personality and antics and yeah, it's, it's interesting to see players. And I don't know. I know, Hay- I know Hayden hadn't decided whether he wanted to sign PPA MLP, but I know he was trying he was, he was in that group of players trying to decide on whether he would sign a new contract. Um, and I just wonder, Adam, if it's the best, it's, if it's still the best and obviously Hayden's a great MLP player. Um, just the way he plays and his energy and his chirping, it, it's, it's perfect translation to MLP um, and the team stuff. I just wonder if in some scenarios that players would be better off having more visibility on the APP tour. Or if that's, or if that's still looked at as like, you know, why would you, why would you do that? Um, but like guys like Hayden and Callen are getting lost in the fold, right? You're like you're not hearing about it as much. You're not, especially with no MLP. You're not. They're not front of mind like a lot of these other teams are. Right. So so is it? I mean, it's clear cut that 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 PPA just overall body of work has the edge and talent. But if you are losing in the round of 16 at a PPA and you're making consistent semifinals and possibly championship Sundays on APP tour. I think it's an interesting question to bring up for sure. What is better for whatever the kids like to call it their brand or whatever these days. Uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, reasonable talking point and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the answer is. Yeah. I think it's, I think a lot of it's, you know, player goals and, and what you're looking for, uh, you know, there's there's a, there's there's real money to be made on the APP tour this year, especially you know with the incentive. If you play six tournaments, you get 1.5x. You know what the what the baseline prize money is. If you play 12, 12 or more tournaments, you get 2x what the prize money is. And we're we're talking at 150k events. You know, you're making 12k as a team if you win. So I mean, you're talking you're talking solid prize money and. And I, I, don't, I don't know quite what the situation is with PPA MLP um, other than the fact that I know players are on salary. I don't know what the prize money situation is, if there's prize money on top of what you're getting paid. 
but it's uh, yeah, it, it is an interesting argument. It's an interesting talking point. I think if if players are young and um, you know have a lot of pickleball in front of them, call it like a Hayden. Um, you could make a you could you could be very front of mind very often playing those AP. Yeah, definitely something that uh, we'll we'll discuss again uh, moving forward for sure. Uh, stepping over to the mixed doubles for Minnesota, two teams kind of stuck out to me, and I wonder who you would take in this particular matchup. We have Viv and Thomas, studs, consistent, been having phenomenal results in mixed doubles, but like you said, the match of the previous tournament in Mesa was the one seed versus uh, Catherine Parento and Jack Sock. So between Catherine and Sock and Viv and Thomas, who would you take? Dude, that's I, I don't even know, and I don't particularly care. I would just that would be such a fun match. That would be such a fun match to watch, right? Um, because pretty, I would say, incredibly similar styles. Um, maybe maybe Viv and Thomas are. Um, I would say a bit steadier, just based off of um, just based off of Thomas probably being a little. Um, I would say shot selection wise, probably just more reps, more experience, plays the right shot a bit more often than Jack. But obviously, Jack has all the intangibles and can do stuff that we haven't seen on a pickleball court at this point. So, do that. I mean, but both both yeah. So I look at I look at Viv and Catherine as. Um, I would say Catherine's a slightly better version of Viv, like same kind of player, same kind of um, game. And I would say Thomas and Thomas and Jack are pretty similar players, incredibly athletic. Both, both really can move incredibly well, look to hit their forehand from the left side, whether it's a dink or whether it's cleaning up in the middle, but use, using forehand as a weapon and trying to not hit very many backhands at all. Um, but I will say what I was impressed with with Jack was that he wa- he was able to f- have some nice little flicks off the backhand out of the air. So it's not like he can only take that forehand. It was great to see him be able to reach in and take some backhands out of the air because, um, yeah, it makes you extremely dangerous. And um, I hope we get to see that matchup. That'll be fun. Yeah, and of course he has the fear hand, so you can't blame him with his skill set for running around the backhand. But I, I was just wondering if it possibly stunted his growth on the backhand side. Because if he can stay home, and I've seen the wrist, and he seems to get uh, a little extra wrist and pop when he goes for Ernie's from the left. But I haven't seen it as much when he just a standard attack. So if he can find a way to speed up off the bounce with two hands on the backhand and flick the one out of the air and then load up on that forehand side, that just seems like a disgusting combination to me. So, of course, he's, he's never going to stop running around his backhand to some degree, but I wonder, kind of like Thomas has done, he used to be like 90-10 forehand yeah. to backhand, and now it's more like a two-to-one situation. So yeah. uh, it, it'll kind of be interesting to see where he settles. Another team that stood out to me here is... This is kind of nitpicking, you know, given, you know, they're not too deep into their careers. But is it possible that Christian Alshon and Hurricane Tyra Black have had a mini plateau in their game? I believe about four to six months ago, they were both very hot ticket items, uh, you know, sky's the limit with their skill sets. And I think just a handful of the results very, very early in 2024 haven't quite been there. And I think it, it's it's something that happens to a lot of players. First on the scene, great player. Not that they get figured out, but people just get more used to their shots. And, and they're very, very good, but maybe don't take that next step that we were thinking they would. Yeah, I think it's I think it's possible. I also just think with, uh, well, first off, Tyra's birthday a few days ago. So big happy birthday, Tyra. Um, I would say... It's tough in these scenarios when you have some great results, especially in in these PPA draws where there's so many good players and there's you know you lose and you lose and you're out. There's no come around. Um, it's it's easy for results to kind of dip or fall. Uh, I think we have a, we have a we had a better sense of that plateau with players in the past, Adam, just because 
we would be able to see like results we just had more data each each event right like we had the main draw then we like even if they lost we could see how they progress in the back draw and we just had a lot more matches and a lot more data whereas then like now they could lose you know in the quarters to a really really good team and it's like we don't know would they come around and get back to the gold or get back to a bronze very possibly uh, but it's just we it takes so much more time to figure that out now because we don't see them again until the next tournament which could be a couple weeks away. It could be a few weeks away. So, and again, it could happen again. And then it's like, okay, two events in a row where they only made the quarters. Like, you know, are they plateauing? Did they fall off? And it's like, maybe, but they also lost, and I'm just making this up hypothetically, but, you know, but they also lost 11 out of the third to a great team. So does that mean they yeah. plateaued? So it's just, I think it's, I think it's tougher now to, to gauge based on just less matches being played. Yeah, so maybe with the come around, it only takes three or four or five uh, tournaments to really get an idea of where they're at. And now it might be half a season's worth of tournaments, 10, 12, or yeah. 15. So uh, I think that that's a great point and uh, love both of their skill sets. And, 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 you know, maybe maybe it's no plateau at all. They just lost 11-9 to, to a very good team yeah. in, in the quarterfinals. And that's why we weren't able to see them progression progress in the draw. Uh I saw a little Anna Bright and Colin Johns. Uh, Colin looking for the right side, strong side, I'm sure, and that mixed match up another interesting uh, uh, pairing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you. I know you hate it when I list teams, but I'm gonna list four or five here. Yeah. And I'm I don't hate. I don't hate it. This is actually. I'm enjoying this because we have a bunch of new matchups and it's super fun. Right. Right. So uh, I'm gonna put four or five uh, mixed teams together, and then you can tell me uh, who you like of the pool. We well, we have the the super veteran squads and. Andrea Coop and Zane Navratil paired up with Lucy and Matt. We also have uh, Callie and Jay, who gets lumped into that veteran squad. You have Paris and Rafa Hewitt, interesting team. Stratman and Arnold, veterans. And then you have Federico Staxroot and Rachel Rohrabacher, who have only played a handful of tournaments. I believe they had a couple quality wins in Palm Springs, but not much to speak of. Only one other tournament, so so very small sample. So are you looking to who I have coming out of that group? Yeah, just miss maybe a tidbit uh, about a team or two, or possibly one that you see as yeah. uh, a, a step above the others. Yeah, I mean, just looking at it, obviously you have you have Coop and Zane who have played a ton together. Uh, maybe not so much recently, but have a ton of history and background and played a bunch of APPs in the past together. You have Lucy and Matt who obviously have played exclusively together for a very, very long time. Callie J over the last couple of years. Uh, Paris Rafa, that's a, I think that's a new one. Um, I think Paris is going to like playing the left side. I think she's more comfortable over there. And I think Rafa's, Rafa... You know, Rafa can be great, and Rafa can go in lulls, but he can he, he he can put a lot of pressure on the other team in mixed. Um, he he moves really well, and he can pinch middle hard, and has a nice big forehand in the middle. So, um, and then obviously Lauren and Julian looking to kind of defend the result last year where they got to the final on uh, Championship Sunday last year in Minnesota. So they've got a proven track record of playing really well there. And this was kind of you know it's a shame that that James isn't here. I mean, this was, I would say this was kind of his breakout tournament last year. So I'm sure he's bummed to, to not make it up. That was kind of the intro to big Papa Jimmy. And, uh, yeah. So bummer not to see him. Hopefully his shoulders healing up. Do you know, Adam, how he's doing in terms of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I'm, I messaged with him a little bit and he just, I'm going to be out for a little bit, you know, Did, yeah, no, nothing, yeah, yeah. nothing specific or anything like that. And you know what? I know I'm the good cop, Rob, but I'm about to call you out for something sure. you just said. Is that yep. cool with you? I, yeah. I'm gonna I, say I'm gonna say Paris does not like the left side more than the right. I think that she is more comfortable on the right side and I think it's uh, everything you said about Rafa is correct, but I think it is an interesting matchup from that regard. Clearly she can play left just fine, but I would say that she she prefers the right more than the left. Potentially in mix. I think when she's played with Simone she's preferred to be on the left. Uh, okay, but maybe so recall it, but, but, out recall out i like that yeah but we can yeah i mean paris could tell us right paris could just tell us <laughs> yeah, um, certainly can. but i think in terms of this group and i like that adam i want you to call me out more i, I really appreciate that um <laughs> out of this group though in terms of who do i think let's say this was a mini draw of six teams quarterfinals i like and this might be a little bit of a hot take 
I like Fed and Rachel getting out of this. Yeah, I think there's a lot to uh, no. I think yeah. there's a lot to like with that squad, and I just can't quite remember who they beat in Palm Springs, but it was a very good squad. And Rora Bacher just setting up with those roles, and Federico with his great movement. You know, not a full-fledged alpha from a power perspective, I would say, but with the way he moves and that ability to to kind of step over to the middle and control the point with his forehand, I think there's a lot to like there as well. So I think that that's completely fine. And uh, you know what? I'll, I'll just last, last last touch up on this on this mixed draw. I'm going to give a, a little shout out to my boy Deckelbar. You know I like to do that. He's matched up with Tina Pisnik. Uh, and they are uh, playing quite a few together. And I know uh, NML, who we haven't seen in a, in a while, NML with their used to do the blogs. They always used to talk smack about Deckel's mixed game and how he should be better. So I, I would like to see uh, a Deckel and Tina step up. And I think this is definitely a field that they could do some damage and possibly squeeze into a semifinal or or a championship Sunday. Yeah, the only my only thought with that with that partnership. And I don't think this is even a hot take. I just think I, I think Tina's so strong on the left. I remember like when she was first coming on the scene and I would play her um, and mixed against her and Martin Emrich. I just remember going cross court dinking with uh, Tina and being like, Jesus Christ, dude. She's like, this is like, I mean, she's knifing these dinks she, <laughs> and she's not missing. It's like usually you can hit like five, six. And you'll get a pop up, or you'll get like some uncertainty. And she was just like sticking in it so well. Um, so my only question there is like I know how good she is on the left. The question is, uh, can she can she replicate that on the right and be that strong with the forehand dinks? And it's 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 I th I think it's kind of rare when we see players be equally as strong on one side in terms of their dinking ability because I think. For a lot of, especially tennis players, that backhand kind of slice dink comes super naturally, especially if you play with a lot of slice in tennis, because um, it's a natural stroke. It's the same stroke, essentially. And we don't have much of a forehand call it. You know, it's changing now with, like, the forehand roll. Uh, that's more of, like, a top spin forehand that you'd hit in tennis. But prior, like, just hitting a kind of a flat dink, it's, like, not a shot you'd really hit in tennis. So it's a little bit more uncomfortable for a lot of players converting from tennis. So... I think it's a big question on on how how good Tina can get on the right, and I think if she can get almost as good as she is on the left, that that's an incredibly dangerous team. Gotcha, and uh, no, that's that, that's a good take, and I mean, I, I think th there's obviously I I used a forehand slice in tennis, and obviously Hurricane Tyra did, but even that that's that's pretty rare. Almost everyone, even if their their go-to shot is not their backhand slice, when they get in trouble in tennis, they go to that backhand slice, so it's much more comfortable. And moving on to, to women's doubles, and I'm just, even though Piznik hasn't been playing that long, I'm just going to put her in the veteran group just because of her game style. I mean, she yep. is, she's a solid rock, and, and she makes some great decisions out there. So we have four veteran teams, and I'm going to put them in a group as well, and we'll talk about the group. We have Leia and Lena. We have Elise Jones and Lauren Stratman. We have Andrea Coop and Tina Pisnik. And we have Lucy and Callie. All very experienced players and very experienced teams. And I could, yeah, I think you could go a couple different ways with that, that grouping. Oh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting grouping. Are, would you say these are the top, um, are these the top seeds that are there, you think? Uh, well, th this is I have a veteran grouping, and then I have sure. a three-team more volatility upside grouping as well that we'll sure. talk about after. And and I think that uh, Lucy and Callie are probably going to have a very very high team. Well, because they're good and because of their PPA points. And then yeah. I would expect in the next group Anna and Rachel. So I would expect those to be the top two seeds: Anna and Rachel, yep. and Lucy, Lucy and Callie. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, honestly, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, I think I think we've seen Coop Coop's level maybe dip a bit. I don't know if it's dipped or if other players have just gotten better. Um, but I like them in that group of four, man. I think I think I think Coop and Piznik will be really tough. I think Coop will be on the right, I'm assuming, and Tina will be on the left. And I think they're going to make a lot of balls. I honestly haven't seen I haven't seen Andrea play enough recently. Um, Elise and Stratman, 
could be very, very good as well. I would say Lucy Cali probably the most consistent out of that bunch, uh, just based on results and based on time on court together. Um, and I would expect that they would probably get out of that group. Leia is obviously Leia, and Lena haven't seen haven't seen quite as. I mean, this is a great partnership for Lena, right? So, um, hoping to probably take advantage of having Leia as a as a higher end partner, and hopefully she can they can make a run. Um, but again, like kind of like. Pretty, pretty outside of Lucy Cali, pretty fun partnerships and interesting. Um, but yeah, I think I think Anna Bright, Rachel will be in my head pretty clear favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that's a pretty good assessment there. Uh, and and I, I do think it's probably a little bit of both for Coop. You know, she's she has a job. I know she had a bit of an injury, not exactly sure what it was. Don't think it was too serious, but definitely something that kind of stopped her playing for a couple months. So it's probably a combination of both mid thirties, uh, slight level dip and everyone else getting so much better. So, I mean, I, I think I had a real hot take, whatever, 18 months ago, and I put her at like two or three in my rankings. And I, I, I think she is days uh, than that high uh, from a rankings perspective and a couple paired with uh, Anna and Rachel, who have a, a great high floor and a high ceiling. The two very dangerous teams that I saw were Paris and Tyra Black, and then also uh, a team who I think is pretty solid on paper, Vivian David and Lacey Schneeman. I wouldn't sleep on Viv and Lacey. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a tough partnership. Yeah, that'll be fun. Th th these are fun partnerships. I think Paris and Tyra will be will be super dangerous too i think so just on i mean having paris play ppa um i do know that the johnsons are playing app's so and that hunter's gonna play with Susanna, i believe um in app so i'm i'm assuming that the johnsons either got bought out or haven't haven't sorted out the contract yet but my assumption is, since Paris isn't playing with Hunter, is that Paris has come to an agreement with MLP PPA. Obviously, this is this is an assumption based off of seeing her in the PPA, not in Sacramento, and Hunter seeking out other partners other than Paris. So I think it's a fairly safe assumption to say Paris is going to be playing MLP PPA and that the Johnsons will be sticking with APP and free agent, free agent independent stuff, um, which I think is pretty – Pretty interesting and exciting to have, um, yeah, just another high-level female playing playing in these tournaments. Yeah, no, and, and man, there's there's a lot of dots to connect. So yeah, uh, yep. I think I think we, we of course we said it with the disclaimer. You know, some of this is ongoing negotiation negotiations, and some of this info probably says a lot about what's going on. And it's it's even though it's over, it's it's not over. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I expect a lot more information to come out in the next couple of weeks about who's doing what, and, and kind of things start to settle, and, and we see more consistent players playing whatever tour it might be. Uh, well, that's 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 about all I have on the the preview for Minnesota. A very exciting weekend of pickleball and some different looks, and I think the. Uh, the streams and the viewership is going to be popping with with some of this some of this fun stuff going on. Yeah, and just uh, just to do a quick recap, I think there's you know this this weekend is going to be super fun. We're going to have Sacramento, we're going to have Minnesota, a lot of new pairings, a lot of new matchups, kind of a new landscape in terms of who's playing what, which is super fun. There was a, a little bit of a low key tournament this past week, and that many people might not know about, and that was in Delray, where we had some of the top we had some top PPA players playing it. Um, we had we had Lee Waters making a return to the court, playing with Anna Bright as kind of the one seed, and they ended up winning the tournament, but not without dropping a match. They lost a match to Georgia Johnson, who also played with uh, Krista Getcheva, which I would okay. call which I would call an upset. But then did but then Lee and Anna came around and took the tournament, um, I believe. And then on the men's side, had some interesting results where. Alshon and Tardio were, I think, the clear one seed and by, by a pretty wide margin. But, you know, I think they won the tournament, but not without, not without dropping some games. Um, and not just dropping some games, but some incredibly tight matches. And I think their first tight match was against uh, Brandon Hubschman and Tanner Tomasi, 
which I believe was like 11-9 or 12-10 in the third. Like a, an absolute dogfight. And I think every single game was really, really close and tight. So um, Alshon Tardio getting pushed to the brink in, in a few matches. I know they played Goldberg and Will Howells and dropped a game to them as well. Um, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny Goldberg, right side, right side legend. And, uh, yeah, it just, you know, shows how good Will Howells is getting as well. So, um, and Will, Will's playing with J-Dub this weekend at Sacramento. So those are uh, – Tardio and Alshon ended up winning the tournament, but not without getting pushed to the brink. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I've seen the Tomasi guy on some draws. Don't know a lot about him. Uh, but, I mean, Hubschman, quality player, but I think his, his meme game is a bit stronger than his overall pickleball game. So very exciting and interesting score lines and – Love, love, love to see it. So, uh, nice little yep. tidbit there, Robert, uh, on the low key tourney and Delray Beach. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, I guess, players must have gotten permission to play those. I don't know. We'll see how that shakes out in terms of what players can play because that that surprised me a little bit that um, Anna was able to play it and Alshon, who are who who are just you know clear cut, clear cut uh, PPA sign players. Uh, PPA MLP, whatever. I, I hate having to say PPA MLP every time. We got a PPA MLP. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, Papa. I'll just I'll just deal with it. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of a lot of uncertainty in terms of landscape and what players can do and what players are going where. But I expect all of that will be kind of sorted out in the coming weeks. And um, I'd like to see you know you know I'll, I obviously said I took a buyout. Um, I'd like to see players just yeah let's let's announce it let's what 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 did you do um you know if you got bought out you got bought out you're gonna be independent let's you know let's let the people know so we can know where to where to watch you where to cheer for you what you're gonna play and that'd be that'd be just interesting for players to start kind of you know announcing or releasing what their situation is just so fans and players um yeah no so I think hopefully we get some of that in the coming weeks. Yeah, Robert, I think we might have to slightly tone down our, our uh, caffeine consumption before these because we had, we had an hour and 20 last time, and we're creeping up on the same number this time. Obviously, lots to talk about, but over that hour threshold, you know, I start, I start losing my train of thought and start, you know, focusing on lunch and things like that. So I think it might be time to shut it down. What do you say? Yeah, that works for me. I just want, I do want to say that I don't know if that's kind of like a steel blue hoodie that you're wearing, but it really makes your eyes pop, and I like it a lot. Well, thank you, and I gave. Or is it, it just nice... white? It's just white, isn't it? It's just white. It's just Damn white. It. But but it, it's you know it, it, either way it's popping. So that's yeah. That's that's a good thing for everyone. Adam, do you like my hat? What does it say, Robert? Honestly, I thought it was money, and it's a little silhouette of Caitlin Clark drilling a three from the logo. So oh, nice. there's a there's a fun interview last year that she did um, in a game where she hit a game winner. And I think uh, whoever was interviewing her was just like, when you released the ball, like what like did you think it was going to go in? Did, what like what were you thought? And she was like, honestly, I thought it was money. It was just such a great line from, you know, it's just so casual that like, she just drilled a game winner. And a shout out to Kayla Clark. She just became the all time leading scorer in NCAA basketball history, not men's, women's, just past Pistol Pete Maravich. So doing a lot for the doing a lot for women's sports in general, but um dude, I yeah, I watched her be Ohio State yesterday. Super fun to watch. She declared for the WNBA draft. I mean ticket prices yesterday to get into the building in Iowa City at Carver Arena was like five hundred bucks um for like nosebleed seats. Like what she's doing for women's sports is bonkers it's so cool to see and um yeah i I mean i joke about a little bit on instagram and stuff and and post caitlin clark probably too much on my twitter as well but um yeah it's just she's she's super fun to watch and i think i think she's gonna go number one in the WNBA draft which i would never care i would have never cared about but i've told you about this before adam like when you have generational players where you don't and i you don't know what they're going to do on the court or the course or the field, whatever it may be. Like I lump Jordan, I lump Tiger Woods, um, stuff like like players like that. And you don't know where Caitlin Clark's going to shoot from. She might shoot from half court and drill it. And it's like, how can the skinny frame have a basic jumper from that deep and just, and be able to, like, I would have to throw with one arm, you know? So it's like, 
it's just fun to watch and i know i go on caitlin clark rants a lot and it's you're right it's probably too much caffeine and now we're over we're getting at an hour so I'll, i'm done i'm done i'm done okay I'm done. okay, okay. That's, that, that's good robert <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect nothing i got i got nothing nothing else okay to say. well obviously so big shout out to selkirk for uh producing distributing editing the show um appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the channel selkirk tv we appreciate you and we will see you next week because we do this show every week now and it's every it's released on wednesday every week let's go